Well, another G Day is in the books. The Georgia Bulldogs conclude their 2019 spring practice with the annual scrimmage at Sanford Stadium uh, this past Saturday, a couple of days ago. In today's video, I'm going to give you the brutally honest, good, bad, and ugly from Georgia's spring game. Let's go. It's me, Uncle Lou, and I'm live for you on LouTube today. Thanks for watching. Man, I sure do appreciate it. I, I, I can't even tell you how much. Uh, all right, Georgia Spring Game. I did the preview video, uh, what, Saturday morning. I told you guys I'd do a uh, wrap-up video. Here it is. Brutally honest version. You guys have been watching me uh, for a while. You know I don't sugarcoat things when it comes to UGA. I'm not one of these Disney dogs. I'm not one of these Rainbow and Unicorn fans who thinks the sun is always shining. Uh, in Athens, Georgia, no matter what, I call it right down the middle, just like I see it. And after watching the spring game on Saturday, uh, a couple of times now, I've got some takeaways from the game. Let me start with sort of this, this disclaimer here, because there's going to be a hundred comments down there that uh, it's just a spring. Uh, this idiot thinks the spring game means something for the regular season. I, I, no, uh, I, I realize that you can't necessarily take what you see in the spring game and then extrapolate that. To the regular season and i covered that in the preview video but some people are hard-headed and ignorant uh, and won't be able to make the connection so no I, I i get that just because a b or c happened at the spring game doesn't mean that d e or l is going to happen in the regular season i get that but listen there are spring games it's the only football we have to watch this time of year uh when in terms of college football the aaf is canceled even too uh, but So, of course, we're going to talk about it and break it down. Uh, Georgia could have came out and looked 100% perfect in the spring game. I wouldn't get on here and say that means they're going undefeated. They could have looked like absolute crap uh, in the spring game, and I wouldn't come on here and say they're going winless. I, I get that that's not how it works, but I do think there's a few things you can get from the spring game. And like I mentioned, we're going to talk about that now. Some good, some bad, and some ugly. Uh, let's start with sort of uh, a, just a, a general overview um, of the game. Attendance. Uh, attendance was way down from what we've seen in the previous three or four years at UJ. Now, this was no surprise to Uncle Lou. In fact, I made a lot of money this past week betting with UGA fans on the uh, attendance numbers of the spring game. Uh, I knew the weather was going to be iffy. I knew it was Easter weekend. But most importantly, and this is what I believe played the biggest factor in the attendance numbers taking a nosedive, um, this past weekend compared to other seasons. Um, Georgia didn't, didn't end last season on a very good note, and it's not even necessarily that they lost their last two games. Of course, the SEC championship game to Alabama and then the Sugar Bowl to Texas. It's not necessarily that they lost. It was sort of the overall a attitude and atmosphere of the program. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that here because I made a couple of videos on that specifically, uh, but just the the... The lack of preparation that was that obviously went into the Sugar Bowl, the the sort of we don't care attitude that a lot of the players seem to have about the Sugar Bowl, um, and some of the things that happened uh, leading up to the Sugar Bowl on, on social media and and players staying out the night before the game, and in spring practice rolls around, you get six players arrested in a five week period. It just sort of seemed like some of the team wasn't taking things seriously. And so I, I sort of looked at that and I said, well, listen, if, if the team can't take the Sugar Bowl seriously and, and, and bother to show up for that, I'm not sure, uh, not sure that they can really expect the fans to show up like they have been for a spring game. So I sort of had an idea the attendance numbers were going to be down. I do think Easter also had an impact. Obviously, the weather, I think, too, had an impact. But I don't think you can just uh, brush away uh, the, the sort of disaffected feelings that some fans had based on the way last season ended and some of the things that have gone on over the last couple of months in terms of arrests and things like that. Um, so about 50,000 at the game. I think the official announced number was 52,000 and something, way down from previous years where we had you know close to 100 a few years ago, 82,000. Uh, so down from that. Not totally unexpected. Uh, now, 
the best thing I got from watching the spring game is actually nothing related to the game itself. So we'll start with that and we'll put this in the good category, right? If we're doing like good, bad, and ugly. Definitely put this in the good category. I heard the announcers say uh, nearing the end of the second quarter, if you've got it DVR and you want to go rewatch it and hear exactly what they said, I'm going to paraphrase here. But I heard the announcers say at the end of the second quarter, uh, right before halftime, uh, that they've, you know, of course, been on campus for the last week or so, watching practices, spending time with the team and the coaches and things like this, and that it has been brought to their attention by the coaches that uh, leadership is a huge issue on this team. This was music to my ears. Not, not that leadership is a problem, but that they finally recognized it. Uh, Uncle Lou has been preaching this since December of last year. I mean, it made a lot of people mad also, and too. Uh, which is something that happens a lot around here. But I've been saying for a while, there's no leadership on this on this team. From a top-down coaching perspective and in the locker room amongst the players, there appears to be no leadership. Uh, what happened leading up to the Sugar Bowl should not have happened. Uh, and to me, that showed a lack of leadership. Uh, so many players get in trouble during spring practice, to me, showed a lack of leadership. Something I harped on this uh, for the last four or five Months, of course, you guys remember uh, former Georgia Bulldog uh, great Tim Worley wrote that article after the Sugar Bowl, uh, which I made a video on, and he sort of felt the same way. So, anyway, uh, it's a problem that the players recognize, and they actually brought it to the coaches' attention. I guess they, they, they have a leadership council on the team, and some of the players, uh, some of the higher-ups in that leadership council came to the coaches and said, uh, th there's an issue here with leadership. We think the leadership council is too big. We want to shrink it down to more of a core group of players um, that can more easily buy into the leadership message we're trying to sell and then deliver that message to the rest of the team. Anyway, you can go back and watch exactly what it is the announcer said, but the main takeaway for me was that the problem has been recognized. And, and, and of course, the first step to solving any problem is you have to recognize it. Um, now, I'm patiently waiting and looking forward to step two, three, and four, which is, you know, what are they going to do about it? What sort of changes do they make? Uh, how effective will it be? And what will the impact be um, both at practice and on the field in terms of performance and overall attitude of the team? But to me, that was, that was the best thing I took away from watching the spring game, honestly, because that is a huge problem that can eat at a team from the inside out. And I'm glad they've recognized that problem, and I hope they're able to turn it around and get it headed in the right direction. All right, now on to some of the actual game itself, good, bad, ugly. We'll, uh, we'll start with the good on the, uh, on the offense. Offensive line. Georgia's offensive line is going to be absolutely unbelievable this year. I've talked about it a, a, a couple of times over the last couple of months, and nothing I saw uh, at the spring game maybe changed my mind. The announcers spent some time talking about the announcers uh, mentioned that they you know they go to a lot of games and you watch uh, pregame warmups or whatever with the teams, and they said uh, you know usually when you're down in pregame warmups as a reporter you want to go and watch the running backs work out or the wide receivers work out or maybe the DBs or the linebackers or whatever. He said most reporters that come to a, a Georgia practice or 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 a pregame warmup type situation for Georgia one of the first position groups they want to go look at is the offensive line. They said it is just unbelievable to look at Georgia's offensive line, and I couldn't agree more. I think they're going to be the best offensive line in America. Um, it's just going to be absolutely unreal. Andrew Thomas at left tackle, Solomon Kinley at left guard, Trey Hill at center, uh, Isaiah Wilson at right tackle, and right guard, I think the only position that's a little bit up in the air. The good news is there's three five stars fighting for that one right guard position. You got sort of the uh, oldest, oldest of the three, Ben Cleveland, uh, and then you have Jamari Sawyer and Cade Mays. All three of those guys are five stars. I, I guess Cleveland is in line right now to get the start, but like we saw last year, I, I think all three of those guys will probably get a lot of playing time this year, but just absolutely loaded at that right guard position with, with, with three five stars. But the offensive line is going to be Unbelievable to be the biggest offensive line in the SEC, and I think one of the best in America. Um, so that definitely falls into the good category. The bad category, Jake Fromm. Uh, listen, uh, again, I'll repeat, I, just because something happens in the spring game, I don't think you can pro project that to the regular season, but Jake Fromm looked terrible in the spring game to me. He started 0 for 4 with a pick 6. Uh, he was something like 8 for 18 in the first half. Um, I saw a lot of the same type of stuff I saw last year in terms of check down, short comeback routes, uh, out routes, 
Um, uh, there are a few more passes to tight ends than what we're used to uh, seeing, and I'll get to a little bit more of that in a second. Um, but I, I wasn't impressed with what I saw from Jake Fromm in the spring game. Now, we've seen Jake Fromm play two full seasons, so we know what we can expect or hope to get from Jake Fromm in a regular game. But in terms of just this spring game, Jake Fromm did not look good to me at all. Um, you know, uh, he, he just didn't play to, played better in the second half than he did in the first half. Of course, that's a, a theme for Jake Fromm in the regular season. The first was the first five or six games of the regular season last year. He was absolutely terrible in the first half and then turned it on in the second half. Complete opposite, though. Uh, when you look at what he's done against Alabama in the last two years. He's been lights out in the first half against Alabama the last two years and then completely disappeared in the second half against Alabama the last two years. We've scored a total of 10 points against Alabama uh, in the last two years in the second half. That's averaging five points per second half. Not going to beat very many good teams that way. Uh, anyway, uh, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole again. Uh, but I wasn't impressed with uh, Jake Fromm at the QB position. Dewan Mathis, I, I got about what I thought I would see from Dewan Mathis. A really athletic guy with a huge arm who needs some uh, who needs some work with the playbook, uh, needs some work sitting in the in, in the pocket making reads, things like that. Nothing unexpected there by true freshman. And Stetson Bennett again, uh, I, I got what I thought I would get from him. Uh, he, he's this is his second full year in the program, or third full year in the program. Really, he left went JUCO, now he came back. Uh, so he's familiar with some of the players, the team, the playbook, that kind of thing. Uh, teeny guy, not the biggest guy, not the fastest guy, all that kind of stuff, but he's athletic. Uh, and he can sling the ball, too. He, look, he looks he looks small out there, but some of the throws he made, um, he, he sort of surprises you, uh, right? I think, was it Matt Landers he hit uh, down the seam towards the end of the second quarter? Anyway, I think it was. Uh, so... This is Jake Fromm's team, though. It's nothing like the last two years where you had, of course, Fromm and Eason, and then last year Fromm and Fields, and sort of wondering, you know, is there a chance we're going to see somebody else start or whatever? No, Jake Fromm's going to be the guy. Um, you, you know, say what you want about him, whether you think he's the greatest ever or whether you think he's the worst ever. Jake Fromm is the quarterback for the University of Georgia in 2018. Just forget about anybody else uh, ex except for mop-up work. Uh, that's just reality of the situation. The ugly... Oh, God, the wide receiver position. And this is really becoming frustrating now. We have recruited, or I, at least I feel like Georgia has recruited um, better at the wide receiver position over the last two or three years than we've ever recruited. Do we have anybody in the last four or five years that's an A.J. Green type talent? No, but let's be real. That's probably a once in a generation or a once in a lifetime type receiver that we got there with A.J. Green. But multiple five stars, multiple high four stars, and there just doesn't seem to be an elite receiver on this team. There just doesn't seem to be. I like I like Holloman, and I like Simmons. But, you know, these are two guys we've seen play a lot. We sort of know what we're going to get with them, right? They're good receivers. I don't think they're elite college-level receivers. Um, I, 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 I just don't. Um, and then some of the other guys that I was looking forward to seeing were a huge disappointment on Saturday, mainly Matt Landers. Uh, this guy, Matt Landers, makes Jason Stanley look like a good wide receiver. This guy can't catch. Uh, he, he got hands like feet. I've never seen anything like it. I don't. I, he, he dropped at least half a dozen passes in this game. Um, I, it, I think it's time to close the book on Matt Landers and forget about him. Like, what is he, a junior this year? Um, you know, you look at Matt Landers, and he looks like every Pro Bowl NFL wide receiver you've ever seen. Tall, big, fast, can jump through the roof, but the guy cannot catch to save his life. Uh, it looks to me like if Georgia's going to have a breakout year at a wide receiver position, um, they're going to have to rely on two guys that are not on campus yet, and that's Blaylock and, uh, uh, shoot, drawing a blank on the other guy's name now, uh, Pickens, Blaylock and uh, Pickens. Uh, two five stars, uh, four, depending on where you look. But anyway, two highly recruited wide receivers that are going to show up in this summer as, uh, over the summer as true freshmen. If if one of those two guys doesn't show up ready to go, then we're going to be we're going to be worse off at the wide receiver position this year than we were last year. Uh, you know, last year of course you had Terry Godwin, Riley Ridley, uh, Miko Harmon. Um, again, I don't really think any of those three guys were elite level wide receivers, uh, but they were way above average. For what what's on our roster right now does not compete with what was on our roster last year. It's not as good. Uh, if we have to go to a three or four wide receiver set right now, we're way worse off this year than we were last year at the wide receiver position. We're going to need some help from Pickens or Blaylock or both. Uh, we're going to have to hope that those guys show up ready to play. And uh, a note to Kirby Smart, if you're watching. I'm pretty sure that you are. 
A wide receiver's number one objective is to catch passes. I, I This whole, if they don't block, if they don't know how to block, they can't play thing, we need to forget about that and do away with that, okay? You want to put Tyler Simmons and whoever else out there on first and 10 to block on these handoff up the middles? Fine. Third and seven or longer is a passing down, sir. You're not fooling anybody uh, by putting a bunch of blocking wide receivers out there and running play action pass up the middle on third and nine. You're not fooling anybody. Put the wide receivers out there that can catch the ball. Put the wide receivers out there that can catch the ball, whoever that is. It's not Matt Landers. I didn't see anything from Tommy Bush that has impressed me. Kyrus Jackson was okay at times at best. Jeremiah Holland and Tyler Simmons are the only known quantities you have. Neither one of them is an elite college-level wide receiver. They're just not. We need help. Put the guys out there that can catch. Now, I know D-Rob didn't play, and people have been real high on him uh, over the spring, including myself. Word is he had a stomach bug the night before the game, uh, so they kept him out. Uh, under normal conditions, I would hear that, and I would and I would just go right on about my day. I'm, but I'm not going to lie to you, though. Given everything that's gone on at UGA over the past couple of months, when I heard that, I didn't believe it. Um, I, I said, well, he done did something and got in some kind of trouble, and they're, and they're punishing him by holding him out of the game. I don't know that. I haven't heard that. I don't have any inside information on that. It just sort of goes to the state of the program now that you hear something like that, and you, and you can't just automatically believe it because there's just been so much bad going on. Uh, you, you hear something like that, and my first instinct was, oh, well, he got in some kind of trouble, and, and the stomach bug is just the excuse. I don't know. Um, but we're going to need help from him for sure, and like I said, the two young guys are going to have to step up because right now at the wide receiver position, it, it just doesn't look good, the University of Georgia. They can't create separation. Half of them can't run routes. I don't know if this is a coaching issue where – where we're, we're recruiting good wide receivers, but they're not getting coached up. Or I don't know if this is a recruiting issue where we're doing a bad job of evaluating talent at the wide receiver position. I don't know which it is, uh, but it's one of the two um, because there's no excuse for Georgia's wide receivers not to be one of the best groups in the SEC. And if, you, if, if you've watched Georgia play the last couple of years or this spring game, it just doesn't translate on the field. So uh, you put that in the ugly category. I'll talk about the defense a little bit. Uh, the defensive secondary. I, I I knew the defensive secondary was going to be good this year. I underestimated it. Georgia's secondary looks absolutely unbelievable. Um, Stokes, listen to what I'm fixing to tell you now. Eric Stokes, cornerback, junior, I believe, three-star, is the best player on our defense. But that's a fact, Jack. This guy, Eric Stokes, looks like a first-round NFL draft pick. Now, uh, he came on last year uh, in place of Tyson Campbell. If you guys remember, of course, we had DeAndre Baker locking down one side last year, and highly uh, recruited freshman Tyson Campbell got the start on the other side. He struggled the first half of the season and ended up getting benched towards the end of the season for Eric Stokes, who looked way better. Now, this year, you're going to have Campbell on one side, maybe, and Stokes on the other side, which is a definite. Stokes is definitely one of your starting corners. And he looks like the best player on Georgia's defense to me when you watch the game. He is blanketing the receiver on every single play. Now, like I said, our receivers aren't the greatest in the world. But this guy looks absolutely unbelievable on the defensive side of the ball. Um, so he definitely goes in the good category. And I would put the entire defensive secondary in the good category. J.R. Reed looked good. Richard LeCount looked good. You got Tyson Campbell on the other side. We've got two um, new guys coming in, one Juco and one freshman with Tyreek Stevenson and D.J. Daniel that I think are both going to get some looks and some playing time this year. Um, William Poole, Breeny. I mean, I could go on and on with the two deep in the secondary position, but I think Georgia's secondary is going to be the strongest part of its defense again. Uh, it was last year, and I think it will be again this year. I don't think Stokes is as good as DeAndre Baker yet, although he's got some potential. But I think overall our secondary will be better than what it was last year, and they looked really, really good on Saturday. Linebacker position, still a concern for me. Um, we need immediate help at the inside linebacker position. The Kobe Dean, I hope he ends up being ready to go. Uh, there's just no game-changing player at the linebacker position, either on the outside or on the inside right now. Now, there are some young guys with potential, N'Kobe Dean, um, Adam Anderson, Britton Cox, Nolan Smith. I mean, these guys have a ton of talent, but they haven't done anything really yet. And this was a weak spot on our team last year in terms of, uh, in two areas, really, uh, pass rush 
and stopping the run up the middle. Now, Georgia's defense is really, really fast, so we do okay against the runs to the outside in terms of tracking people down from the backside and not letting them cut the corner and things like that, but we got gashed in a lot of games up the middle uh, because our inside linebacker play was below average. And if we don't get some help in that area this year or, or some vast improvement from some of the guys that are coming back, I think it's going to be an issue again this year. Now, for, for I don't maybe I'm wrong here. I didn't notice Jordan Davis getting a whole lot of playing time in his spring game, and I didn't hear whether he was hurt or held out for some particular reason. I was really high on this guy coming into this year. I thought he played well last year as a true freshman. Very, raw talent, though. Uh, but I, his ceiling seemed really, really high. He's a huge guy. Remind me of John Atkins a little bit. Um, not so I wasn't not sure what was going on with him, and maybe I should have checked on that before I hit record. But anyway, I didn't because uh, I'm a, I'm a half wit. But anyway, um, I'm okay with him at the nose tackle position. But the defensive tackle position is it has been a disappointment really at UGA going back three or four years now. Um, I mean, we've had some guys with that you thought coming in were going to be super talented and just never really lived up to it. I mean, I do think David Marshall and Tyler Clark are good defensive tackles, but none of neither of them are elite in my opinion. Trent Thompson was supposed to be, um, you know, the best defensive tackle recruit really that we'd ever had. He was a complete bust. Um, it just it just hasn't lived up to the hype for me uh, at the defensive tackle position at UGA over the last few years, especially when you look around the SEC at some of the other defensive tackles in the league. UGA just doesn't have anything to compete there. Um, and the same can be said on the outside. Going back several years, we had Leonard Floyd. Going back a few a little bit more recently, you had Lorenzo Carter, who still wasn't as good as as Leonard Floyd. But And as hard as I was on Lorenzo Carter when he was at UGA, he's been better than anything we've had since there. Um, like I said, I do think Britton Cox, Adam Anderson, and Nolan Smith have some serious ability and potential at that position, but it's nothing that we've seen happen yet. I want to see more sacks. I'm tired of this BS about, oh, it's just affect the quarterback. The best way to affect the quarterback is to sack him. I'm tired of being dead last in the SEC and sacks and quarterback pressures and all this kind of stuff. Need to step that up. Um, so uh, hard to hard to judge that group of players, linebackers, I mean, based off of the spring game. Uh, it, it, it really is, especially the pressure in the quarterback thing. I mean, you're not allowed to look at the quarterback in a spring game, much less touch him or tackle him. So kind of hard to get a gauge for that. Um, but but the linebackers in the front seven, I have I, I'm not worried at all about the secondary. I still have some question marks about the front seven, um, even after going through now spring practice and watching the G Day game. I think there's a lot of talent there, uh, but I've yet to see most of that talent get anywhere near its potential. Hopefully that will happen. Um, hopefully that will happen this year. Anyway, that's sort of my thoughts on the game there. Let me know what you thought about the game if you watched it down below. Uh, sort of a dead time now. Uh, practice will start back up, I guess, towards the end of May or June. Uh, so, listen, any news you hear about your team between now and, uh, and the end of May is going to be bad news. If you hear anything about your team between now and the end of June, it's bad news. It means somebody done got in trouble, arrested, something like that. This is the time of year where you typically see a lot of bad things happen with college players at college campuses. Hopefully Georgia got it all out of their system during spring practice with the six arrests we had or whatever it was, six arrests in six weeks, whatever it was. So hopefully we're done with all that uh, and this new leadership deal that the players are, are looking into can nip that in the bud, I hope. Uh, but I can tell you right now, every morning when I get up and check my, my news feeds for Georgia Bulldogs news, I'm going to be crossing my fingers that I don't see anything. Um, that that's, that's the best case scenario for me. No stupid off-season injuries, right? You had Sony Michelle with a four-wheeler accident a couple of years ago. You had Jake Fromm uh, trying to go fishing and hook him in him himself in the arm and leg and everywhere else instead of a, instead of a fish. None of that kind of stuff. Let's get through the, the this, this downtime with with no silly injuries, no arrests. Everybody behave yourself and uh, get geared up for these summer workouts. And 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 the other freshmen who weren't in early enrollees will start showing up, and we'll, we'll really start to get a look at uh, what we're going to have for the 2019 season. Anyway, appreciate you guys watching. This is long-winded here. Um, uh, you, you have to be a serious fan if you watch this long of a video about the spring game. But anyway, I appreciate it. Uh, live shows this week will be Tuesday and Thursday night at 10 p.m. Eastern, and the videos for the rest of this week will be best-case, worst-case uh, scenario videos. You guys take it easy, and have a great morning.